Of the many fine philosophers I have read at grand universities around the world, my favorite was C.S. Black. She wrote her philosophy on the back of utility bill envelopes. And this is one. You are one thought away from perfect happiness, and you are in control of that thought. There are those of us in the world who spend years in monastic lifestyles searching for perfect happiness by giving up chocolate and a comfortable bed and serving the greater good of society. And I myself spent three years in such a monastic lifestyle. And at the end of that time, I did attain a sense of intense joy, great enlightenment through the power of my thinking. And at the end of that time, C.S. Black paid me a visit. And she said of my life, you know, you can find enlightenment drinking whiskey in a whorehouse. It's a matter of focus. Being that she was my mother, I decided to test her ideas. And so the next day, I went out and bought a box of chocolate and a comfortable bed. And she was right. From time to time, I still attain these moments of perfect happiness, even with a mouthful of chocolate. The third type of thinking that we use in responding to the primal calls to write is intuitive thinking. And this is when the whole package of a complex idea arrives all at once. And it comes infinitely faster than you are able to explain it or capture it in any form of language. It's thought of as sudden insight. Uh, sometimes it might be called gestalt. And it typically arrives when you're moving between work and play, when you're getting on the bus after work or going for a swim. Sometimes when you're waking up in the morning and you're coming out of a dream state, it can happen then as well. It typically arrives in a shift between different modes of work and play. When we are in an intuitive mode of thought, we have no concept of time. Everybody's experienced this at some point in their life. You'll be working on a creative project and thinking, well, that must be about 45 minutes. You look at the clock and three hours have passed and you cannot account for the time because you've been outside of time during that period. It arrives without logic, without emotion. There's no feeling attached to it. There's no logical sequence that you've gone through in order to work with this kind of thinking. This can also be something that you feel when you're in a deep conversation with somebody else that you, you get going and the two of you are really connecting and then you look at the clock and three hours have passed when it felt like a half an hour. This kind of thinking can be dangerous. Um, and I'm not warning anyone against it. What I'm saying is that you receive ideas from a different realm than the logical world, and they can often be far ahead of their time. You see things that others in the world cannot see, and that's why you are an artist and given the title of artist. Artists are the mediums, art medium, the mediums who see what is coming, the cultural scouts guiding us along the edges of the social frontier. You have to be careful at times when these ideas come, because when you try to explain them to somebody else who's not in a place where they can understand it, they'll often be shocked or they just ridicule at, as this being ridiculous, such as what William Farish got when he tried to implement a grading system at Oxford. There are those of us who move through the world already with an advanced skill in intuitive intellect. Albert Einstein was a person who intentionally engaged intuitive thinking often. He would receive the answer to very complex problems in physics all at once 
and it said that it took him days to then translate these ideas into the logical language of mathematics in order to share it with other people. When Einstein said intuition is all that matters, he wasn't just giving us a nice phrase for a greeting card. He was trying to tell us about a mode of thinking that we can engage, open, train, and develop. There have been some scientific studies in brain research on sudden insight that talk about the situation that makes intuition more common. And one of those is meditation. People who regularly meditate tend to have more moments of sudden insight or of this type of thinking coming along. It's interesting to see logic trying to understand intuition. It's almost funny. So now let's turn to the second pillar of universal grammar of story, and that is language, which I sometimes call Delilah's scissors. At its fundamental core, language is the drumbeat of our social interaction. It is the cadence that carries us through our day. And in courses I'm teaching in English, I ask my writers to listen to a number of recordings of the most ancient form of English, Anglo-Saxon. The idea is not to understand anything. It is to hear the archaic rhythm of the language in their head without understanding. And it's important you don't understand it so that you just feel the cadence of it. Now we get to the Delilah scissors part of language. There are certain very lazy words that carry emotion for us without our needing to do the work of understanding those emotions and using those emotions. And such words are all of profanity and all of the filler words. For example, when one man cuts another man off in traffic and screams a particular word, couple of words out the window, he is not actually accusing the other man of maternal incest. He is in fact saying, you have demeaned me, you have disrespected me, and I'm, I'm upset about this. But you don't hear men saying that to one another on the highway. Instead, they just scream out something that in effect carries that emotional work for them. Writers cannot afford to do that without careful understanding of what they really mean and feel. So the first thing I do is there's a relatively short assignment. It lasts about a week. I ask my writers to be aware of all of the gestures and words that they use to carry emotion for them. So they keep track of all of the filler words and all of the profanity and they record what these words are actually truly saying. Then there's a six month fast, a six month fast of profanity and filler words where you say what you actually feel. But if you, you know, don't get fired or punched in the mouth because you've done something undiplomatic, if the situation does not allow for the appropriate use of your feelings, record them in your mind and write them down later. What were you feeling in that situation? As you begin to become aware of how you use these junk words, and they are junk words because they don't supply you any nourishment. They're like candy. They're a momentary high that leave you drained a few hours later. As you become aware of them, then they begin to change. And at the end of the sixth month, I tell my writers, go back. Now you can write these words because no, you cannot use them in your writing either. But at the end of the six months, you can. Now put them back in and you'll see that the use of them radically changes and that they take on power and life and they're not just stagnant, dead weight. Delilah has not cut off your hair. Of course, when I say you can't use them in your writing, I mean your story writing. Certainly you need to put them in your journal about what you wanted to say and what it meant. As you change the use of profanity, there will be physical changes in your brain. Neurologically, the way your mind fires will begin to change. 
and that will affect other areas of your life, other areas of your thinking and moving through the world.